you. Uh, did I do that successfully? I believe so. You should. Oh, here we go. So that's now. Okay, so I'll show my screen. Okay. Okay. So you get okay, yourself okay. all ready, and I'll uh, I'll hit the start broadcast button and count down t minus sixty seconds. Or okay. Or <laughs> we have. And, and, and for any questions, you're you're fielding questions. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so people can uh, send me. Um, that's a good thing to ask. Do you like to be interrupted? Or do you want me to hold them to the end? No, no, no. If if uh, no, if there's a question during, it's probably you know the, the circumstances may change, and if they ask at the end, I may be so far away from what I was doing, it might not be easy to get back to it. So yeah, if someone has a direct question, uh, okay. go ahead and, and I'll uh, do a little ask editing. Them. If they're really really far afield, I'll obviously ignore it and uh, okay. give you the ones that are that are juicy. <laughs> including what you yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start the broadcast in uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, Corel Painter webinar attendees. Thanks for joining us today for the revving up the Painter Brush Engine with John Derry. This is Andy Church calling. I'm the product manager for uh, Corel Digital digital art painting products. Really excited to have John here today. He really is a, a true pioneer in the world of digital art. Uh, as many of you may know, he was one of the original authors of Corel Painter, and he's been a great friend of Corel ever since. He's uh, got a master's degree, and he's very active in the teaching community on uh, lynda.com. So I'd like to welcome you, John, and uh, effectively turn this presentation over to you, because it's it's all about you and all about Painter. So welcome, and uh, I will just pass on one final point uh, logistic side if you want to pose a question to John during the session by all means use the chat feature and we'll field the questions as we go and with any luck we'll have you uh, back to your day or evening it's around quarter to the next hour over to you John okay now I just want to make sure you can hear me you can't hear me oh so I can't hear you Andy I just want to be sure there's always a little bit of uh, but I see my microphone seems to be uh, working here. So I'm going to assume, unless I hear differently, that I am now being heard. So uh, thank you, Andy, and thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, what I'm going to go through this morning is some real basic uh, control of brushes and painter. As you know, there is a, a huge number of brushes uh, available in painter. And uh, sometimes people look at this control panel that I'm bringing up, and it uh, it can be a little scary because there is a lot of control. But be advised that Painter, as an application, has matured over the year to include uh, several what I call brush engines. A brush engine is just. Uh, are you there, Andy? Yes, I'm, I am. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Just checking. Uh, and so what's happened over time is as completely new media, say like watercolor, is introduced. In fact, it's kind of been introduced uh, at least three different times over the history of the product. And as a result, there's the, the, the capabilities change. Like the most recent version now has these uh, 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 maps that allow you to flow the paint in specific directions. All of that requires a very specific kind of engine to be able to incorporate that into Painter. So as a result, you, you've got all of these different engines. You've got a watercolor engine, a liquid ink engine, a real bristle engine. You, you've got all these engines. And that's why this control panel or the brush panel can look so daunting to someone. Be, but the thing is that any one of the brushes only uses a small subset, generally, of all of these controls. And the one thing, since Andy's listening, this is just I would throw this out. I would love it if whatever brush uh, or whatever uh, preset you've selected, it would be great if the ones that actually have active controls in them in this whole stack could maybe be color coded with light blue or something that it would let the users know, oh, the, you know, the, the ones that are dim, like, like or just take for example, the ones that happen to have the tabs lighter. That's just an accident of the ones that have been opened. But let's say that the digital airbrush utilized just those panels. I could see in a glance, oh, 
you know, I can go to the general panel or the well panel. This it doesn't really correspond to the digital airbrush. But if it did, just the panels that are actually have a control that's active that would control digital airbrush, if it was color coded in a way, it would be great to be able to it give you a little bit of resolution like, okay, don't even bother with these ones that are sort of grayed out. They have no control. Anyway. John, you're bang on with one of our oh. roadmap items. This is a oh, great okay. suggestion. And oh. uh, bringing a little more intelligence to the tab. To oh, well, that's back. great. Great. Yeah, yeah that, that will, that's a big help. Okay, so to get into this, I'm going to just show you very basic control information. And we're going to start with the lowly of lowest brushes in Painter, and that is in the ink, uh, ink, and so I'm going to go here to, or I'm sorry, I want to go to pens, not ink, pens, and there's this one here, flat color. This is what I call the dumbest brush in painter, and because it is because all it is is this black circle, and it's repeating it very uh, closely uh, over one another, so you start to get this illusion of a continuous stroke. And if we look at a few things here, oh, and one thing while this is here, I want to mention this. This brush calibration is a great new tool. It used to be that there was a global control that adjusted all the brushes. But as I just mentioned, because of these multiple brush engines in Painter, some of the, 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 the global nature of this kind of falls down. It doesn't work like it used to. It turns out that different brush engines have different sensitivities, and as a result, this brush calibration allows you to enable uh, calibration on a brush by brush basis. And that's important because as I said, if you just set this to one setting fits all, you'll find quickly that in the, the, the version of Painter now with, with so much uh, in the way of brush engines, uh, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, you'll find some brushes, oh, I wish it had a greater pressure sensitivity or, or more velocity or whatever it is. And so this enables you to do this on a brush-by-brush -brush basis. And I, I can't say this is right for everybody, but for me, I always start by cranking pressure scale up all the way. And this happens to be a brush that doesn't show much. Maybe just as a, 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 a matter of introducing this, I will switch temporarily to the scratch board tool which is a favorite uh, brush of mine. In fact, this is what I was playing with recently. I'm going to set it back to normal here. OK, so here's a brush that would seem to have a, a light to heavy pressure. And I'm not able to get it. But that's because brush calibration isn't enabled for it. Now, let's enable it. And I'm still not really getting for my particular hand pressure. And keep in mind, we all have different uh, you know, some people have a light hand. Some people are heavy-handed. So all of that plays into you know how would you adjust this? And as I said, I know for me by cranking these all the way up, I get a much better. See now I can get at the very light end of that scale, and I can press all the way up to the the high end of the scale. And as a result, I get a very nice brush with all of that expressibility in it. And you'll hear me mention expressibility a lot throughout this. Uh, expressibility to me is how much does the brush have some variables in it that allow it to have a range of expression? And so just by having you know, thin to thick lines right there, that is uh, expressibility. It lets me decide, do I want a, a very thin line, do I want a very thick line? Or do I just want to draw and not even think about what's thick and what's thin and let my hand do the expressing? And at first, you'll find that these are the kinds of things you'll probably consciously think about. But as you start working with any tool over time, you internalize it, and it just becomes you know, a, a tool. And I always use my, my signature kind of as a quick way to test out expressibility, because our, our signature is probably one of the most expressive marks we each make. It's, it's unique to each of us. So your, your uh, signature is just a great little test to see you know, how expressible is that brush. And it's like, wow, yeah, it's got a lot of line width in it. So I like that for that form of expressibility. But anyway, brush calibration is really important. In fact, I even take it and I kind of stick it over here because I use it so much that I like to have it just on this main uh, uh, panel that has the, the kind of my most used uh, features. OK, so let's go back to our, our brush that we were talking about before here, the flat color. And I want to show you just a few things about it. For one thing, uh, we're going to look at spacing. 
And the thing about spacing is, and this is not going to be true in every brush. I'm just showing you one brush model. But the kinds of expressible features that I happen to be showing you with the flat br color brush here are there are some controls that are, are similar or related to each preset in Painter. And they, they won't always be the same. Some don't even have spacing control. But just be advised that this is an example of one kind of brush. And I'm showing it because it's a very simple model. And based on what I show you here today, you should be able to start to play around with creating your own brush. Or if, at the very least, you'll see, oh, making these adjustments over here uh, change the quality of the brush. And I will also show you here in a moment, you can never damage this panel. You can never get it to where, oh, my gosh, I've completely screwed up this brush. There's no way to get it back. Do not worry. Like the, in this case, let's say I did this, and I, I don't even know what I did to make this happen. How do I get back? Well, I call this button right up here, the reset tool. This is the panic button. When you panic and all of a sudden you think, I've lost uh, how this brush works, just hit the panic button or the reset tool, and it takes it back to its uh, original factory settings. So you can never destroy a brush and painter and not get back to it. So right there, that should encourage you to do a bit of experimentation with brushes. If not modifying an existing brush, start trying to maybe take one from scratch and start to totally modify it. And that's what we're going to do here. So the reason this has this very simple round tip is due to, in the general tab, we'll see this dab type says circular. And you'll notice, if I open up dab, look at all of the dab types there are. Once again, this gets into these different brush engines, like there's a liquid ink brush engine. So there's a whole bunch of uh, specific dab types for liquid ink. Then we get into watercolor. There's a brush engine that has a specific set of tips for the watercolor. Then you get into uh, just a bunch of, I don't, again, I'm not going to try to go through all these. We're just going to look at this very simply. But that's why there's so many of these here. Likewise, if you go into stroke type, you'll see there are four different stroke types. If we go into method, which controls some of the behavior of the brush, uh, there's a bunch of those. So if you made a matrix up of all of the methods, the stroke types, the dab types, as well as the subcategories of the methods, you'd, you'd have an incredible, you know, it's probably in the millions of possible combinations of these that you could get, at least a very high number. And right there, that starts to show you why Painter can have so many different mediums in it, because it's just a combination of these different settings throughout all of the brush panel. And you know somebody at some time has gone in and adjusted every one of these for a certain type of brush. And then they save that as a variant. So a variant is nothing more than a recipe for a particular brush. And when you change a brush, all of these controls are the ones that affect the, the brush, uh, the variant that you're loading, they will change. So you're just getting some presets. And that's great to start with, but, but my hope is that over time, you will be encouraged like, hey, that's a great preset, but I wish for my form of expression, I wish it did whatever. And that's where you can get into uh, being able to start learning to make adjustments so you can make it express it the way you want. It, it's kind of like getting a guitar with the, the strings from the, 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 you know, the music shop, and you play it, and it sounds OK. But you know you could put a different set of strings on it. It's going to change the tonality of it. Or you, could, if it's a, if it's got a, a pickup or it's an electric guitar, you could you know make adjustments on the the surface of the guitar to change the tonality of that instrument. And that that's what all of these are doing. So just as someone would buy a guitar stock and then put new strings on it, make adjustments to it, maybe buy special boxes you can plug in for you know reverb or whatever effect. They are altering the default feeling of that you know, gestural or expressive instrument to meet their gestural or expressive expectations. And that's all we're doing here. So I'm going to show you how to take this, this very simple dumb brush and make it uh, much more expressive. The first thing we're going to do is get away from just this simple rounded you know, round dot. And to do that, I'm going to go from the circular brush. I'm going to select static bristle. Okay. Now, we won't see much of a change at first. Uh, but you do see here in the dab profile, if it was set, you know, you'll see these little 
icons under here. This sets what the view of the DAB profile is. This is how it's set by default, but you just noticed, because I was playing with it earlier, I had set it over to here. And this is particularly important when you select a static bristle. Now, the other thing you need in order, once you've adjusted or set your DAB type to a static bristle, you need to actually call up or have open the static bristle uh, panel. Okay, so now with this, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and just temporarily move this up here because you'll see in a moment why having it near the DAB profile itself is important. Uh, that is because, whoops, I didn't, uh, where, oh, right here, I just want to drop it down one more right in there. Okay, well, I'll get it yet. It's like threading a needle. You have to just be in the right spot. There we go. Okay, now. I've got these controls. Look what happens when I start to adjust the static bristle controls because I now have the static bristle dab type active. I can start to play with the quality of what this is painting with. And at first, we're not getting much in the way of a great looking brush, but at least we're getting a difference because it is now using this dab. And I can adjust the features of this static bristle so that I can get a lot of different play in this. So that's a wide range of expressibility right there. Now, the problem that it's having is it's exhibiting what I call tire tracks. If you look at that, it almost looks like the tread of a, a tire in the snow. This is because the spacing is too wide, and we're not getting that illusion of continuousness that we got earlier with the flat bristle. So we need to change spacing. So I'm going to temporarily jump into the spacing, and I'm going to adjust this. Now, remember, there's this nice little preview here that shows me a stroke. So not only do I see the dab, I see the stroke. And I watch what happens when I start to adjust this spacing down. See how it's getting more and more continuous? It used to be in the old days when processors weren't nearly as fast as they are today that if you took these down really low, it could start to slow up your machine. And if you still have a very old machine, you may find that, that this adjustment can uh, uh, affect how the brush is going to work. But in, on today's machines, you can pretty much reduce this down to its minimum settings, and you'll still get a pretty, if not re a real-time brush with no lag or delay in it. So now that I've got a brush that looks like it's giving a continuous stroke, I can further play around with this feature here. I'm going to change the thickness. See how now I'm getting a fine appearance of brush hairs? And I can also adjust this clumpiness, which just kind of plays with, are all the brush hairs exactly the same width? Or do I introduce a little bit of randomness into the varying strokes in there? The other thing that is not working for me right now is I don't have brush calibration enabled. Watch, if I enable this and turn this up, I'll bet you I get. Yeah, I'm starting to already sense just a slight difference in the way this is working. So if you don't, if you want to follow what I'm saying, I would recommend that you have this brush calibration tab around very quickly so that when you open up any variant, you can turn this on for that variant. And then you can have this localized control. Now, the other thing I can play with is the hair scale. And let's just play with that. And we'll see here that we're getting, see now I'm starting to get it much more uh, farther apart. Now, you don't even really need to know what these do because you do have these previews that tell you, you know, what, what is this going to look like. And so even if you don't really know what you're doing, just experimentation alone will start to yield uh, differences in here that you may like. You may say, wow, you know, I kind of like the way this looks now. I'm making a real mess. Let, let's get a little color into this too. So now I've got a brush. I'm starting to like the way it works. I can also play with something like right now it always is the same size. So to adjust that, I'm going to want to look at, first of all, the preview size here. And when it's round and black like that, this means that it has no variance in size based on something like pressure. So if we go to the size slider here, you can see the minimum size is 100%. Watch this as I adjust minimum size down. See how it's showing me what the minimum size could be? Now, nothing's going to happen yet because I have the expression set to none. If I set this to pressure, now 
I can adjust the size of that brush. The minimum size it's going to be is the size I've got right here. And if we look at the minimum size, it's 33% of its full size. I, you know, I can take it all the way down, so I've got a very dramatic change. I don't want it that dramatic, so I'm going to turn it back up. I kind of liked it around 33%. So now we've got a brush that is starting to have some real character. And each of you, if you get into doing this afterwards, remember now that you've got this set, you can start to play with this and say, well, gee, maybe more clumpiness, maybe not, you know, maybe less clumpiness. Just all of these things come into play, and you can tweak this to get it the way you want it to look. Now. We've, we've played with the behavior of what the brush mark itself looks like and its uh, stroke width. So now we've got more expression than we certainly had when the flat color was in its native form. The next thing I want to do is play with how does it interact with color. And to do that, we need to talk a little bit about something called the well. And what the well is, and it's right down here, and I may pop this up just uh, there we go uh, what, oops I think I might have no sometimes it uh, where did I put it there it's right there okay the well controls two things it controls how much paint comes out of your brush and that is called resaturation how much paint comes out is how quickly you're resaturating the well with color and then you have bleed bleed controls how much does it pick up any color that it finds and you can see right now we've got a brush that all it does right now is lay down color because its resaturation is at 100 percent bleed it does none of so right now it's just a, a flat brush that paints over a different color but let's turn resaturation all the way down and let's turn bleed up even just a little now watch what's happening see how it's it's now it pick it it's taking a little bit of the color actually at this point right now all it's doing is blending that color if you take bleed even as low as 1% i'm trying to get down pretty close there 1% it will pretty much pick up and interact with the color that it finds underneath of it so now i've got a brush that blends color. So this is effectively a blender at this point. And that's when you run into a lot of brushes in Painter that are called blenders. Basically, resaturation is turned down and bleed is enabled to some degree, 1% or more. And that makes it a blending brush. If I, tar if I turn this up a little bit more, let's just take it up to about 10%, and then I put a little bit of resaturation in there that's less than bleed, you'll see it does pick up color but it also has a tendency to want to bleed a little bit with the underlying color. And it's pretty minimal right now. And so there's one thing we can do here. And this is a little bit of an advanced trick, but I will show it to you. In the well, there are these, every time you have an expression, and right now there's no expression. I'm going to set both of these to pressure. Let's see what happens if both of these are at pressure. Okay, it's still acting fairly the same, although you can see I can get a little bit more lighter, uh, less opaque at the beginning of my stroke and then I can turn it up. Let's keep adding colors here so we continue to see what's happening. I'm, I'm going to now go back to the well and you'll see this little button right here. Whenever you have this expression pop up, you'll see this little uh, icon. And what this does is it, let me, it lets me reverse how things are going to work. So right now, this is set so that at its lightest pressure, bleed is doing the, the least amount of work and as I turn it up it's bleed it's increasing the bleed up to the full 11 uh, percent however resaturation is kind of overriding it and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to invert this now what that means is at the lowest end of the scale it's going to have the most amount of bleed so now this brush starts to see how it's almost a, a bleed just bleeds at the lightest end of the pressure. But as I start to add more pressure, it becomes more and more of an opaque brush. So this is a brush just by you know setting both the expression of resaturation and bleed in the well panel uh, to pressure and then inverting the pressure 
of bleed, I've got a brush that's kind of a dual function brush. At the, at the lightest pressure, it's primarily a blender, and at the top end of pressure, it's primarily an opaque paint delivering brush. So this gives me a brush with some very interesting expressibility in it. You can see here, I can start to get a lot of different color going on in this brush based on the fact that I've adjusted the well to these custom settings for this particular brush to give me the ability to have a blender at the low end of my pressure scale, and that only happens because of this little invert the bleed expression, a little trick here, and uh, that gives it the, the, it, it, the dominance is to uh, be a blender at light pressure and become a opaque brush at, at heavier pressure. So that's how this brush works. Now, let's say I want to keep this brush. I, re I really like this. I want it. What we need to do is create a new variant. And to do that, I can just go into brushes here, and I can say, I want to save this variant. And it's going to give me some options. I, I, for example, I could put it in a different you know, category if I want to. But I'm, I'm going to leave it in pens, and I'm going to, now going to call it, uh, I don't know, let's just call it John's... Uh, John's example. Okay. So we've got John's example. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Okay. Now, right now, it still says flat color. You remember how that brush acted at first? Well, until we reset this brush, it's, it now is going to remember these settings. And that, that's a good thing about Painter. As you adjust a brush over time, it remembers the changes you've made to it. And I always describe it as it's like a pair of jeans. When you first buy a pair of Levi's, you know they're 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 starchy. They they're they're not very comfortable. And as you wear them and wash them, they they kind of mold to your shape. And that's the same thing that happens with a brush. As you start to make adjustments to it in Painter, it starts to remember all of the little changes you're making. So the next time you go back to that brush, it's going to be in that the shape that you have dictated it to be. Now, if I want to get back to my flat color brush, remember all I have to do here is hit the uh, panic button or the reset tool, and now I'm back to my regular brush. But wait, have I lost my other brush? No, because we saved that as a new variant. I can go down here, and at the bottom of the list, there it is, John's example, and there's my brush that we just created by making a few changes that you saw uh, just a few moments ago. So now I've got both of those brushes available to me, and uh, that's one of the great things about the way this works. The other thing that's kind of neat, you'll see this, see how I can pick this up and move it in the list? I might want to put this all the way at the top so that it's just, when I load this up, it's, it's right there for me. So this is yet another way to give me an example uh, of uh, how to get to this brush when and where I want it. So hopefully this short little lesson shows by going through this how you can go from a very dumb brush, like I said, just the round flat uh, ink pen is, is the dumbest brush in painter. That's, that's kind of like the most simple model in there. And we, we've taken it, and w let's go through some of the things we did. We hey, John, went to, yes. a couple of questions just, just in go context ahead. here. Um, so really, great, just really great feedback from Terry. She's quite, he or she is quite excited to uh, go start customizing brushes. I asked the question if many people in the audience were, and thanks to this uh, initial section, she's already set to go. But there is a couple of questions. One from Cindy. She's asked, uh, is there a way to back up the variants created? Yes, there is. And uh, what you can do is, what I normally will do is like in an example like this, it's, it's automatically in there. It's saved so that I don't have to worry about losing it. But, you know, and this isn't, I'm not indicting Painter alone. Every app I work in, Photoshop, they all, you know, will occasionally uh, go bump in the night and crash or something. And so, yes, it is possible to lose this. So, what you would want to do in this case is save this category. And you can say right here, you, I could save a new brush category with these in it if I wanted to. Or I could just save the category. And Andy, I am just enough out of 
practice to remember exactly where to go. Can you walk us through? If I wanted to save this category now with this new brush in it, if you'll talk, I'll, I'll work through it. Well, yeah, this, you could actually export them one at a time. You should be able to export the That's entire right. library. So and, if you and, want and, to actually and, share your brush with your friends, right you go here. to the export function there. You can actually export the entire uh, brush or category or library. Right. So and, yeah, nice and, to, yeah. So there's a way you, now to get easily get these brushes you created in and out and shared amongst your uh, your pals. And that's the power. I think the power of Painter lies in brush sharing because uh, all of us, you know, there's some people today who will probably sit down and, I just created the greatest brush ever. Now, someone else might not think that, but they think this brush is really cool. And at the very least, they could save that brush out by itself or they could save a whole category of brushes they've built by themselves, or they could save a whole library of categories of brushes that they've saved by themselves and share them with another user. Once you've exported this, it exports it into a form that literally all you have to do is double click on the save file and it automatically loads it in to a user's copy of Painter. And, and what that means is that as users uh, share brushes, it just increases the library of brushes out there. And so uh, saving a brush or category or entire library is a key way for you to back up your work, but also potentially put it into the pool of brushes that users can share. And uh, that's the, uh, the five cent speech on that. So what, what's the next question, Andy? Now, another question here is interesting. Does research, this is from uh, Sumaya. Uh, does resaturation have anything to do with the actual color being used? How do you use it when cloning? Uh, no, resaturation is, is not uh, associated with cloning. Well, let me say that. I say that, and uh, like I always said about the painter, there's many ways. You know, the painter mountain has many paths to the top, <laughs> and so there are many ways to achieve your your desire. If we go to cloners, I just want to double check here. Yeah, it has resaturation. So a cloner, now by default, let, let's just try this out. This cloner happens to be using the default uh, pattern right now. Like if I change it to something very different, uh, let, let's change it to something with a whole different uh, color in it, like this one. See how that's changing? If I paint enough with this, we'll start to see that pattern. Of course, it's being funneled through this brush so that we're not seeing the pattern clearly. But yes, it is coming through here. And yes, I do have resaturation. So if I uh, turn down resaturation, in fact, any time you see uh, resaturation and bleed, I always look at what, what are these two settings? Because remember, bleed over whichever one of these is is the higher value, it will tend to predominate over the other value. And right now, bleed is set higher, so it, it tends to want to uh, do a bit of bleeding. Whereas if I turn bleed all the way down, now I'm going You don't see it much here because it, it, it's not the greatest example. But this brush starts to act very different. Let, let's say if I take this down and turn bleed up. See, now I'm getting, uh, it's still delivering some of that original color in each stroke, but bleed is now the predominant in this case, and we've turned resaturation down, so it really wants to uh, blend with the color that's underneath of it. So to, to answer your question, not, let's say this, not every brush model uses saturation and bleed, but the ones that do, and in this case, yes, cloners can have and I don't think all of them do because, again, it depends on the brush engine model being used. Uh, anyone that, that does use saturation and bleed can be adjusted. And I should mention, too, I, I took you down to the well uh, panel to talk about uh, resaturation and bleed here and how you can adjust its expression as well as invert its expression. But because these are such important controls to any brushes that do utilize them, they automatically will appear in that brush's uh, brush property bar up at the top. So right there, you can see I've got resaturation and bleed available to me. So in general, any brush 
there are some controls that are just really key to making those expressive adjustments. So any brush you select, like if I go to a very different brush here, like uh, let's go to an airbrush and go to one of the, the new uh, brushes here, like a variable splatter. See how that changed? Uh, this is done in such a way that these are the features, like, like for example, this brush, if I change the flow, for example, I'll, I'll lower it or I'll increase it. See, now it's really applying a lot of uh, Mac, uh, is, what do you want to call those, individual splatters. And then the spread, if I make this very narrow, I get a very narrow splatter pattern. And if I make it very wide, I get a very wide pattern. So at the very least, you know, without even consulting this big uh, brush panel, uh, you can generally just look at the features that are available to adjust in the brush property bar for that particular variant, and these are likely to be the key features that you would want to use to quickly adjust this. That's a great point, John. That, and going back to what you mentioned earlier about uh, more intelligent tab control, that's an area we really are focused on to make it far more progressively uh, <coughs> revealing uh, some of the new customization or in-depth customization that you can do on a brush. One user, I should say one participant today, I believe it was Sandy, asked us to see your general control panel there just to see what settings you made. Uh, generally in these environments, it takes, there's just a lot to look at at once. And sure, oh, and that's to, to the brush that I changed, right? That's correct. Uh, uh, so that, we, that was back here in pins. And I did John's example. So the, everything remained the same. The only thing I changed in the general was I changed from a circular dab, which, as I keep saying, that's the dumbest dab in Painter. And not, not that it's stupid. It just doesn't have a lot of things you can do with it, whereas the static bristle, as we saw, uh, has this ability in concert with the uh, uh, static bristle panel itself to make a lot of changes to that bristle type. And so we, we first changed to a static bristle. Then I called up the static bristle panel itself where I made some adjustments. We also went into the size panel, and I adjusted it from just being a single size down to about a 30 or 3 percent or so. And you know, if you're within a few points of that, you won't notice any difference. And I also turned on pressure so that it now knew that, oh, I'm using pressure to change the, the width uh, or size of that brush. And finally, we went into the well, and I turned pressure on for both bleed and expression. And I turned bleed up so it's somewhat higher than resaturation. And then the real key to this brush, it's kind of the esoteric little trick, is I inverted the bleed expression so that that means at the lightest end of the scale, as opposed to its default behavior, which is at the highest end of the scale, it would bleed the most. But now I've got it set so it's actually providing the most bleed with the minimum pressure. And because of that, at very light pressure, let's change colors here, that's why it's predominantly acting as a blender. But as I press, I'm transitioning into a, uh, a, a, a color applying brush. And so those were the changes uh, that we made to this brush during this particular uh, webinar. Are we still there? We we sure are, John. I was just unmuting my phone. That's uh, we can continue on with your general presentation. I'll just keep tabs and other questions as we go, and uh, we'll continue progressing here. We're about forty minutes uh, in into the session, and. Uh, Let's continue on. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you now, John. Yep. OK, I accidentally pressed a, a button uh, on no my no headset problem. that shut me off. OK, no so the, the many joys of webinars. And actually, I, I love them. They're just it, 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 the, the uh, what do you want? The distance factor can make it a little uh, interesting to deal with sometimes. Uh, what I want to transition into talking a little bit about now is, uh, you know, these are brushes that you can totally make adjustments to. But what I've done in the past is I offered. Let me see if I can do this. I'll switch over to uh, another. 
let's see here. Where's that? I have it over. No, uh, I think I put it right here. Uh, this is a couple, uh, yeah, uh, three years ago. I did a little tutorial on mastering brushes. So some of what I talked about in here was included in this, but th this was a, a, a far more in depth. And I created a, a set of brushes to include in this this little tutorial. And normally these are thirty dollars, but today for anybody that's watching uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm going to offer these for $19.95, and what you'll need to do is email me, and let's uh, go back here, and I will just quickly uh, grab a uh, my favorite little scratch board tool, and if you email me, whoops, oh, I wanted to get yeah, the scratch board tool, there we go, okay, it, it, dairy at pixel art dot com and that that's not a V that's an R so dairy and it doesn't have to be uh, 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 now it looks like Barry oops now I'm going to turn my Wacom pin over and get my eraser which is always great and uh, let, let's do this right so it's dairy at the, there we go so uh, if you email me and tell me that you watch this and you have to use the secret password so don't don't tell anybody else the secret password is Milton Okay, so if you send me an email uh, with with Milton, then I will respond in kind and send you uh, a, a message with the uh, uh, PayPal button uh, for the reduced pro seminar uh, webinar price here uh, for these brushes. And what I'm going to do now is I just I want to show you uh, these brushes so you can see. And, and this is just a, just as I did here. This is is the act of going through and playing around with brushes. Uh, to get a, a variety of different kinds of effects. So let's go to John Brushes 2 here. And I'll just show you a, a few of these. I don't want to say go through all of them. This one, just it, it, it's, I, I just call it a, a blend camel. It's, just, it's a real nice kind of mop almost. You can see how it, it blends. And uh, it, it's just great for laying down uh, specific colors, but still having that ability to blend. But it's got a lot of expression in the, uh, the brush hairs itself. Then we get into uh, the brushy diffuse. And this is another one. This is kind of, again, it's kind of a modifier to existing imagery. So basically, I'm just going in there and kind of adding a, an overall diffusion to it. Uh, another brush in this is the canvas scumble. And this just picks it up and moves it around. So again, these are great for laying down kind of overall color backgrounds, uh, just modifying. Even a, a, a photographic image, you can do some of this stuff to it and get some really interesting kinds of variations. Uh, John's crystal, now this depends on color. So I'm going to just, you can use any color with it. But uh, this just kind of gives you this interesting sort of patterning. And let's, before we go too crazy, I'm going to lower or erase that. Then we get into some of these these uh, interesting enamel brushes. And what what this does, let, let me paint on this one. Uh, oh, wait, wait. No. Uh, I knew this would happen. Uh, what you need to do here, and I'm just going to double check this. Yes, this is set. And... Uh, well, if these if I can't get them to work right now, it's mostly my fault for I thought I had these set up and uh, yes, this wants to be used on a liquid ink layer, so I would think it would have created one. How well, there's a liquid ink layer. Oh, it's a non-liquid ink brush. That's why. There we go. Now this brush just lays down a lot of different colors, and I'm kind of stepping in it here a little bit because I wanted to show you all these and they're not necessarily working like I have. But the uh, the tutorial I go through, I, I provide all of the kinds of controls over these brushes that you'd want to have. So where I'm kind of having a little issue, uh, the instruction will get through this in no problem. You can see there's a little bit of uh, impasto showing up. That's because the brush uh, beneath it has impasto on. So I'm picking up some impasto in that brush. And uh, I want to see if I can get, where's the, does this one work right now? 
the, here's the smeary metallic. I'm going to reduce the size. This is another new tool in Painter 12. If you hold down the command option on Mac, and I guess that would be control alt on Windows, I can instantly adjust my brush size, which is a real nice shortcut. But you can see this brush has depth in it because I've included impasto. And it, these are the kinds of things that it w I wouldn't have nearly enough time to talk about in, the, uh, in, a, in a short webinar. But I can give you these brushes and in the webinar explain how they work, uh, as well as I have some custom layers that you can instantly paint on and they will work, unlike the one that uh, I, I tried to paint on here a moment ago and it didn't work. Uh, that's because I didn't load up the, uh, the layer that I have prepared uh, in that uh, set of brushes. Then you get into, uh, oh, let's try John's Tar. Now this requires a liquid ink. And maybe just to uh, make this a little easier, I'm going to shut off these other, there we go. And, and let's try this liquid ink layer because I think this is the one I had set up. Yeah, see, you know, and this one, here's one reason I'm having a little bit of trouble. Brush calibration is not on. If I turn this on and crank it up like I'm used to doing, for me, now I'm getting a much better... So th these are brushes that are based on liquid ink. And again, I'm not going to go into all of the details of how all these work. But you can see you can get some really nice dimensional effects here. And then for each of these brushes, like the John's Tar, I have the Resist, which actually goes the opposite direction. And it erodes away. So you, you can build up some really interesting, gnarly, textural patterns. Uh, based on uh, brushes that use liquid ink. Here's another one. I have one called this Melty Resist. Th this just really wants to uh, eliminate, and let me see once again if I set this up. Yeah, it, it's just kind of wholesale uh, reducing it. But if I go to the Melty Liquid itself, see now I'm getting a, a really thick liquid. So this is just to entice you uh, into buying my brushes. No, actually, it's <laughs> hey, John, to in, 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 you, Oh, you go ahead. Uh, that, that's <laughs> our last question. Okay. But, uh, they are they are wonderful brushes. The feedback I'm getting is uh, just astounding. So I think you've done a great job showing the uh, the depth of the brush engine, the variability and control, but also uh, the work you've done making your orders fabulous. I love watching them come down. But a uh, question from Carrie. She asks, how can I erase the impasto brush to get the indentations out of it after I've laid it down on the canvas? Oh, an impasto brush. Yes. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let me see. I'm going to get one of my impasto brushes here. I'm pretty sure. Which one did we have here? This, is it the gloss enamel? And I think I need to be on a layer that has impasto enabled. So I'm going to go to impasto here. And I'm going to draw to color and depth. OK, so here is a brush. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Let, let's, uh, I'm trying to find a real simple model to show this for you. Uh, let's reduce the size of the brush a bit. Uh, well, here, I'll tell you what, it's much easier rather than me trying to find something. Let's go to the impasto brushes, and uh, let's just take the uh, ooh, texturizer is a good one, the texturizer heavy. Oh, and I want to do the here. I, I'm going to get rid of all of these uh, layers here. They're kind of getting in our way, so let's... Uh, and it's going to want to, there we go. OK, so when you're painting with impasto, there's, there's three things you can do. You can build up impasto. But in the impasto brushes, you'll find there is a depth eraser, for example. And this lets me erase the depth. You can see how I'm starting to bear down into the depth of the impasto. One way to think of impasto, it's like a mountain range, okay? And if you could turn this on side, you'd see that there are high peaks and then there are valleys. And what I'm doing right here is I'm just carving into the mountain to artificially kind of create a valley into it. But we can also add depth. So if I do the depth lofter, you can see now I'm increasing depth where there was no depth. So now I'm building that shallow area back up. OK, now the third one, this is the one I think Carrie's asking about, is the depth equalizer. This will take this to 
sea, essentially sea level. See that spot right there? That is sea level. That, that is where it's, we're not in the valleys, we're not on the tops of the mountains. So I could still take my depth eraser, let's make it right here, see how I'm carving down into that? And eventually you can hit the limit and it will look like another flat area because the impossible doesn't have infinite depths or infinite heights. But so by using the depth eraser, I can erase away from depth I've created. By using the uh, depth lofter, I can increase any depth that I've created. And using the depth equalizer, I can get to what is the null point. It's, it's, it's the midpoint between the lowest lows and the highest highs. So I hope that explains to you how you can push and pull on impasto uh, through you know, lofting and erasing as well as equalizing that depth. And the thing I wanted to be sure I say here too is it, the main thing I, I'm offer, I want to get these brushes to you is it, it's just it's a way I can tell you much more about the different kinds of brush uh, engines and by far it's not going to cover everything but it'll give you something you can play over and over and watch and you'll have the brushes and you can try them out and uh, experiment from and they may very well just be the, the source point for you to create a variation or a new brush from it so you know these could also just be seeds I'm giving you to be able to take them and, and turn them into your personal expression are you still there Andy I sure am John it's uh, it's 10 to the hour I, I might suggest we uh, we close our webinar today unless uh, you there's a couple of final points you want to make uh, that's really uh, your call. Sure. Well, ho hopefully I I've encouraged you uh, to experiment with the brushes. It it's great. At, at out of the box painter has you know hundreds and hundreds of of intelligently built presets in it. So people could spend months, if not years, just playing with the brushes in their preset condition. However, I'm hoping that you're seeing that there's a whole world out there beyond the presets that you can customize these brushes to match your expressive expectations. And the thing about, you know, if nothing else, what digital art has given to the artist is the, the mighty undo. You know, when, when you paint on a real canvas, when you apply that paint to the canvas, it's difficult if not impossible to remove it without some, you know, uh, a bit of, of its remaining and causing some sort of flaw or something that you didn't, you wish wasn't there. In digital, we can actually just hit Command or Control Z and we can undo. And once you understand that that safety net is in place, by, by default, Painter will do 32 undos. So you, you can paint up to 32 strokes knowing you can get back. You know, and that's just by default. You can increase that number uh, higher if you want. Uh, but knowing that's there, that gives you the safety net and the wherewithal. Try things that you never would have done in traditional media. Uh, I remember when I first got started, I used to say how every art or design project is a series of uh, question and answers. It's a decision tree that you go through. Like the first one would be, OK, do I want to use a circle or a square? And in the old days, it would be your intuition was, and it still is, but it was finely tuned to kind of pre-visualize in your mind. You go, well, I know square is better, so I would go with a square in my analog design. Then the next decision would be, should it be a big square or a small square? And I'd say, well, I know small square is right, so I'd go with that. Then I would go to the next decision, should it be red or blue? I'd say, oh, well, a small blue square, that's what I want. Well, once I got to digital, and I started going down those decision trees, you know, I'd go to, should it be circle or square? And I go, I know it should be square, but I'll try circle because I can. And darned if it didn't actually, like, wow, I never would have tried circle. But now that I see it, 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 it's a whole new design pot. Look at that. That makes a difference. And look, it could be a red circle, and it actually works out well. So the fact that I have the wherewithal to visualize things I normally would not have done in traditional media opens up a whole world for you. Then you add things like layers to that where you can do things, you can break up a painting into multiple layers so that you know you can test out something on a new layer without 
causing you know destructive damage to the existing painting. That alone is worth the price of admission to digital tools. And then with painters brush engine technology in there, you've got you know. Uh, I mean, I've, I have I've nowhere near plumbed the depths of all of Painter's expressive brush technology. It's it you know it it's the Mount Everest of uh, of you know digital media because it just has so many different brush engines that offer such a wide range of looks, but ultimately amount to a wide range of expressibility. And as an artist, that's ultimately what you want. So I hope that kind of finishes this up with some sort of Pseudo intelligent uh, ending. Well, John, thank you so much. The the feedback and comments here have been uh, absolutely wonderful. I'll I'll make sure you, they get exported for you, so you can uh, you can read them over. And uh, I think some people were asking for your website again, so you wouldn't mind just publishing oh, that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh well, you, the Pixel Blog is probably the best place to go. It's just pixelart dot blogspot dot com, and that's where I tend to have all of my. Uh, Different things you can see here too. I've got I've got different brushes for sale that appear right on the front of that blog. So there are several uh, of these in here are also for painter. Uh, and the uh, the thing you know I, I to try to find you know, all you need to know is dairy at pixelart.com. That's you know d e r r y at pixelart p i x l a r t dot com. Just email me. Say I saw the webinar. I'm interested in your brushes, uh, your brush special for 1995. But you got to say Milton, no Milton, no brushes, okay? Uh, and and that will do it. And uh, basically, that that that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, this this presentation will be recorded and posted to Corel.com in the coming week. So if you want to share this with your friends or colleagues, you're more than welcome to. And again, uh, I encourage all of you to reach out to John for his special offer today. Operators are standing by. As they say. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, John. All right. Thanks very much. Take care.